Well, good morning and welcome to Tuesday Morning Bible Study. I am coming to you from Edinburgh, Scotland. No, not really, but I am I have this virtual background, a picture that I took. Uh, and welcome to the Tuesday Morning Bible Study. Today we are in um, uh, actually going to conclude Mark chapter 4 and get into chapter 5. Uh, there's a lot of good material here, as as there always is, and a lot to talk about. Um, <clears throat> and we'll get right into it. Uh, last week, of course, we, we looked at the first 25 verses of chapter 4 and saw how it was a it was a change of pace from what we had been looking at. Uh, you will recall that in chapters two and three, we had been um, we were given a series of conflict stories. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was conflict of uh, the conflicts of Jesus with uh, scribes and Pharisees, even with uh, members of his own family, uh, and. That really, from Mark's, you know, from Mark's narrative point of view, this is this is setting up the basic narrative that it, it's setting up the story for the rest of it. That that Jesus, that Jesus's career and therefore Christians' career, is going to be one that is marked by conflict, con conflict with the powers that be. Uh, remember Mark's own setting. Mark is writing in the midst of the Jewish war, the Jewish rebellion against Rome. And as we will see more and more, the central conflict is not, it's not just about Jewish opposition to Rome, but it's also Mark's Christian community is dealing with the opposition they're getting from the Jewish from the Jewish community, but also maybe even some in the Jewish Christian community who were who were uh, felt that it was appropriate, felt that it was uh, kind of in a kind of sacred and patriotic to join the armed rebellion against Rome, that that was that, you know, that if you were a good Jew, that's what you would do. You would rise up in rebellion. It's very possible that there were, that there were some Jewish Christians um, who were uh, stirred, stirred to join the, the armed rebellion. The Christians, or at least Jesus anyway, Jesus as portrayed in Mark and certainly the early Christian community that Mark is is ministering to or speaking to, um, they're in a really tight spot because they do, in fact, see the Roman occupation as badly as the Jews rising up in rebellion against it do. But there is a there is an important difference. They don't see the armed rebellion as the way to respond to it. Uh, they see they see the coming of the kingdom, God's initiative in the bringing of the kingdom as that which will uh, restore things to uh, to to God's will. Uh, that will, in fact, have the end effect of expelling the Romans. Uh, it's you know we, we we in Christian theology and whatnot we we sometimes we sometimes misunderstand Jesus's intent and and the the early Christian intent as as some uh, a teaching that was somehow or the kingdom message of Jesus as somehow apolitical. And and it's just not true. It's just not true. It's it, the fact is is that Jesus w had as big a problem with the Roman occupation of of Israel as anybody did, as any Jew did. Um, but there was a difference. There was an important difference in how to respond to it. And for Jesus, the answer was not armed rebellion. It was in fact the kingdom message. Now the kingdom message 
is one that we see Jesus dealing with in chapters four and five. Okay. Uh, now, so far we've, you know, so far we've, we've talked about the parable of the sower and the, the seeds and the, and the different responses and the different uh, uh, outcomes, depending on how, on how that seed is received. Uh, recall too, that the seed, the seed is the message of the kingdom. That is the seed is the message of the kingdom. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, traditionally people have interpreted those, those verses in all kinds of ways, uh, including financial ways. And, you know, we looked especially at that business about for to those who have more will be given and from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. You know, that verse has been stripped from context and has been uh, been used to justify, you know, laissez-faire capitalism and and whatnot, and the rich are getting ri the rich getting richer and the poor are getting poorer as God's will, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And and nothing could be could be further from from the intent of 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 the of the passage than than that. I mean, that's horrible. Uh, that the that the seed is the the message of the kingdom, and. <laughs> and the growth of the kingdom. And so what's being talked about as getting more of it or having what you have taken away is your apprehension of the kingdom, is your is your reception of the kingdom. Some people, <clears throat> depending on how they respond to it, will be given more of the mystery of the kingdom, you know, get greater insight and a greater experience of the kingdom, whereas others will Others may have an inkling of it, but depending on what they do with what they have, even what they have will be taken from them. Uh, incidentally, and we'll see this later, but incidentally, that is the basic meaning of the parable of the talents uh, later on, because the parable of talents, like that verse here in Mark chapter four, has been misunderstood badly in the history in the history of interpretation uh badly misunderstood uh to justify justify the rich getting richer and poor getting poor and and that's not what Jesus is talking about at all he's talking about the the experience of the kingdom and the the problem that the the guy who gets the one talent the one talent guy is the problem with him is that he's he doesn't get a, you know, he doesn't get a great apprehension of the kingdom, but he doesn't, what he has, he doesn't do anything with. I mean, at the very least, as, G, you know, in that parable, Jesus says, or the uh, the uh, the landowner, the property owner says, you know, look, if you were, you know, if you had that big of a problem with it, you could have at least, could have at least given it to the bankers and the bankers could have done something with it. <clears throat> Instead, you just wasted it. You just totally squandered it. Um, and that's, and, and why did you do that? You did that for two reasons. One, because you were afraid. And number two, because you misapprehended me, me, the landowner, me, the, you know, because you will remember, I, I know I'm a little off topic, but it does relate to, to this passage here. You'll remember that he said, you know, I didn't do it because uh, I know that you are a hard man and you do all that. There's absolutely nothing in the story to indicate that his his understanding of his boss is accurate. He has the view of the the, the property owner as some tyrant when, in fact, all along, the property owner has been has been incredibly generous He's been incredibly generous this whole time. And yet he's seen by, he's seen by the one talent guy as this tyrant, when if, which is a complete misapprehension of who he is. Uh, and uh and and because he misapprehends the property owner, he does the completely wrong thing with the one talent he does have. And so he ends up losing it. And Again, all of those, all of that talk of seed, all of that talk of of talents, it's all about the kingdom. 
It's all about the apprehension of the kingdom and what you do with what you have. And if you don't use what you have, if you don't use even what you have, even if it's a little bit, you will lose it. Uh, and Jesus, you know, Jesus says, you know, Jesus in effect suggests that the the reason why some people don't use what they have, uh, use that of the kingdom that they have, is either because of fear or because of a misapprehension of who God is, of the of the goodness and the generosity of God. Uh, the people in Jesus's day who are most under attack by this whole line of thinking, this whole approach, whether here in Mark or in that later parable of the talents, the people who are most under attack in this are the people that the world sees as the people who have it the most together. Okay. It's not some poor Joe Schmo who's just a victim of circumstance, <laughs> you know, <laughs> victim of circumstance who who suddenly now is being condemned by, you know, God and all that. No, no, no. The very people, who, the people who are being attacked are the people who do, in fact, have the least of the kingdom. But the people who have the least of the kingdom are the ones who so often have the most you know, of the institutional, the institutional power and authority. So in a way it is, it's the, and it's the people that you would sometimes least expect who are actually the richest in the way of the kingdom. Okay. So, you know, so keep that in mind whenever you come across the, some of these passages that may seem just on a surface reading to be disturbing. They're, they're not nearly as disturbing as they, in, I mean, they are disturbing, but they're not disturbing for the reasons you think they are. Um, they're disturbing because they they challenge us. They make us ask, are we, <laughs> how are we doing with the kingdom, <laughs> the revelation of the kingdom that we have? How What are we doing with it? That's the way it's disturbing, not, not because some Joe Schmo is having what little he has taken away from him. <laughs> so anyway, all right. So <clears throat> last week we were talking about the parable of the sower and Jesus's interpretation of it. Uh, today we uh, we move on. We start at verse 26 and we're going to look uh, at two parables. They're very short. Both are very short. And the first is actually a parable that I said, as I said last week, is a parable that only appears in Mark. It's very short. You know, it, it'd be easy to miss. But it only appears in Mark. There is no parallel to it in uh, Matthew and Matthew or Luke or John for that matter. Okay, so the parable of the growing, the parable of the growing seed, verse twenty six. He also said, Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow he does not know how the earth produces of itself first the stalk then the head then the full grain in the head but when the grain is ripe at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come thoughts no parallel no parallel to this in matthew or luke so it's a mystery how the the planted seed gro grows. He does not know how. Yeah. That fascinates me. Yeah. That is a great turn of phrase. Yes. He does not know how. You know, uh, he does not know how. It's uh, kind of parallels our, you know, the way when we think about the kingdom. We think about the kingdom as Jesus defines it, as Jesus describes it, and how you get there, how you get what what actions constitute the kingdom and uh, or are consistent with the kingdom and all that. Because on one level, the kingdom, at least the way you get there, looks very small and it looks very powerless. Okay. 
and you go about this this way this way of the kingdom which looks very small it looks very inconsequential and yet so the promise goes it's going to when it's received when these seemingly small and inconsequential actions words and deeds are received that there's growth that there's that it has an effect and we look at it i mean even we who you know who want to believe it who who you know at our best practice it still marvel <laughs> still marvel that it has the effect that it does <laughs> you know we know not how we know not how it happens. Uh, <laughs> you will recall, uh, or some of you may recall, a wonderful line, uh, a wonderful scene from uh, the Lord of the Rings uh, novels or movies, you know, depending on what you've read or seen. Uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful thing where uh, Gandalf says that, uh, you know, there's some people who think that only only great deeds wrought by great and powerful figures can change the world, can change history. But that's not what I have found, he says. What I have found is that it's the small acts, the small everyday acts of kindness and love that actually change the course of history uh kind of in the same spirit you'll you'll recall that great speech of uh, bobby kennedy at uh, i think it was uh it was his trip to south africa he went to uh i believe it was cape town south africa and he and it was his ripples of hope speech um uh, and and he said that that you know every time an ordinary person you know, stands up for an ideal, uh, does what is right or stands up for an ideal. And it may be very small. You know, it, 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 there may not be all that many people listening or watching, but every time someone does what is right, that it creates, as he put, as Bob, as Kennedy put it, a, a tiny ripple of hope. And when a whole bunch of people individually are doing that <laughs> they create tiny ripples of hope which combine with other tiny ripples of hope until those time all those tiny ripples of hope combine into a mighty wave that uh, and those are his words a mighty wave wave that will knock down the highest walls of of, of injustice and, and so forth so it's uh I, I dare say, you know, I dare say that Gandalf and Bobby Kennedy <laughs> were talking about this. They, they, you know, well, I mean, obviously Gandalf is fictional. Bobby Kennedy was most assuredly not fictional. Uh, but they both were talking about what Jesus is talking about uh, in terms of in terms of the effect that even small acts can have uh, now as we will see there's <clears throat> jesus wants to make one more point about the smallness of these acts because he's going to turn in the next parable to the parable of the mustard seed okay uh, and so and so he's going to make something of the smallness of it and yet can have great effects but just to dwell just a little more on the parable of the growing seed is that the seeds are sown and they have growth and 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 even even the one who does the sowing doesn't know how the growth happens he knows not how uh doesn't doesn't know how it happens but just knows that it does it doesn't happen everywhere, as we saw in the previous parable. You know, it doesn't happen everywhere. Sometimes it, you know, these seeds of the kingdom fall on rocky ground. 
Sometimes they fall in soil, but then uh, the when it grows up, it gets choked by the thorns and briars of the world. And so it doesn't always bear fruit, but it sometimes does bear fruit. And when it does bear fruit, it bears a lot of fruit. Okay. Uh, now this business about the uh, verse 29, uh, verse 29, it says, but when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. Any guesses as to what Jesus is getting at there? Hint. It, it means exactly what you think it means. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's 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 harvesting, but you know the the image of the sickle always reminds me of death, the reaper. So he goes in with his sickle, sickle because the harvest has come, which may suggest that the kingdom has come because of the heart because of the growth. I'm yeah. not saying that very well, but yeah, that's what I it's see. yeah, it's yeah, it it it's pointing to uh, it's pointing to the final judgment. Yes. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a symbol. It's a it's a type of the final judgment, and it's saying that you know the kingdom message is going to get spread around, and and the seeds of it are are being planted, and growth is is happening, you know, in mysterious ways, in you know all manner of places, and that the day will come. Doesn't doesn't give a timeline, but it says in effect that the day will come when the kingdom that is growing up in mysterious ways in all manner of places will ultimately come to full fruition and the harvest you know the harvest you know that's an image that's used by Jesus often of the day when all those things done in preparation have a a final they have an end they have an end and 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 what what happens then is that god 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 comes god shows up and the judgment happens <clears throat> and the kingdom is finally perfected okay the, the the and and the consequences you know kind of in this apocalyptic jewish sense the consequences of resisting that kingdom are also felt <laughs> as well so it's it is the final judgment uh but yeah 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 so this is this is good now as we go on to uh verse 30 in the parable of the mustard seed you know i i, I just can't you know i can't uh underscore enough that what's what's being emphasized here is the uh, the message of the kingdom and and the how inconsequential even to its even to its fans <laughs> not not to mention the people who are against it but but even to the people who are for it for the kingdom uh how inconsequential that message may look okay so let's look at it the parable of the mustard seed verse 30 jesus also said with what can we compare the kingdom of god or what parable will we will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of of all the seeds of the, on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. We talked about this in our Advent class uh, Sunday because I told you we were studying Mark uh, yeah. from the Mark perspective yeah. and talking about that really the mustard seed uh, is really an invasive plant. It's a it's a weed. Uh -huh. It's not anything grand. It's not like a big uh, redwood tree or anything right. like that. It's really very, very 
maybe that some people would like to get rid of. You know, it's it's not important. Yeah. But but Jesus chooses to use it. Yeah. Now, that's 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 great. Yeah. You know, that's really good is just how. Yeah, it's um, and, it, and this plays into just this idea of how. We. We we could even if we're for it, even if we want it to happen, we still can't predict just how much of a positive effect it can have because it doesn't look like much and yet it gets in there <laughs> like an invasive plant it gets in the ground and it and it spreads and it and it has a it can have a, an effect a growth far beyond what we can even predict what we can even imagine uh I kind of think about too, you know, weeds are hard, much harder to get rid of than good plants. Yeah. Yeah. They really are. It's hard to get rid of weeds. Yeah. 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 It's uh, that's it, it really is a curious image for Jesus to use here, but it but it makes sense too. It makes sense because uh, the idea is of a of a progress to to this you know this isn't these aren't just you know so, small seemingly inconsequential acts of kindness and love that just kind of that just kind of go to nothing you know jesus is saying that small acts of kindness and love seemingly inconsequential things have far-reaching effects far-reaching effects beyond what you can you can imagine uh you know just on a very just a very personal level, you know, not, I mean, not even to talk about, you know, grand systems and, and whatnot, you know, you have no idea the effect that even a well-timed smile at a stranger can have. I mean, you just, you, you, you just have no idea. You can just have no idea the effect that even a small a small act, even a, a smile at someone, the effect that it can have in with far-reaching consequences. You know, I mean, the effect that a a, a kind word, just a, an act of kindness or a kind word, the effect that that can have on somebody who's really struggling. You know, maybe someone who's struggling with uh, ending their own life. You know, uh, and a word of kindness, an act of kindness can can actually bend a trajectory that's headed one way and can bend it another way. And obviously, if you, you know, if you kind of work that out, then <laughs> even even a small, small change of trajectory. I mean, think of it this way. Think of it. Think of geometry. I know everyone enjoyed taking geometry back in school, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, and if you think of, you know, point A and point B is far in the future, right? Point A, point B, <clears throat> they're, so, they're separated by, you know, quite some distance and you change uh, you know, there's a course, okay, say it's you know, it's going in a straight line, and say you change the trajectory even by two degrees, you know, even by two degrees. Well, for a little while, you know, for a little while, it's not going to be that much of a change. But further down the line, <laughs> further down the line, the effect of even a small change is going to have an enormous impact far in the future. The future, even with the, with even a tiny change, there's going to be a huge difference in what happens down the line than what would be if that change never happened, if that trajectory change never happened. Uh, it's... Uh, you know, we speak of the uh, chaos theorists speak of uh, the butterfly effect. Uh, the butterfly effect being uh, the hypothetical, 
the hypothetical difference that the smallest change in initial conditions can introduce the, 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 the tremendous difference that even small changes in the initial conditions of a system can have in the way things play out. In short, this is why long-term weather is so difficult to predict. <laughs> this is why people can't really predict weather even a week out, much less much less a month out. It's not that people aren't, you know, that, that meteorologists aren't smart people and all that, uh, or that they don't understand what they do. It's that there are a million plus little variables that if those variables, those million variables even swing a tiny bit one way or the other, it can have a tremendous difference in how the total system ultimately plays out. Uh, and so the idea, the, the, this is a metaphorical thing, really, but, but, uh, but the chaos theorists will speak of, you know, if a butterfly flaps its way you know flaps its wings in one way and not another <laughs> the turn the tiny the tiniest difference can you know over over time and over over time and space uh can have tremendous differences in how the system plays out it's uh, another another example i think of is the uh, and sarah you could i'm sure you can help me with this it's uh it's that great line from uh I think it's from Richard the Third. It's Shakespeare, uh, Richard the Third, for for want of a nail, for want of a nail, the the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. Uh, 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 or, you know, it, 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 so it plays out. You know, it, and it, so so it's, and then ultimately, you know, for want of a for want of a horse, the rider was lost. The rider was lost, and for want of a rider. The message was lost. For want of that, the the battle was lost. Exactly. For want of for want of that, the kingdom was lost, and all because of, of the nail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh. and that 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 just because you know, with the loss of one nail, <laughs> that yeah. that had far-reaching effects that couldn't be predicted just from the loss of a single nail and you know uh, this passage with the mustard seed has been i remember this is so I'm, I'm ancient but i remember when i was in high school one of the presbyterian ladies gave me a mustard seed in a you know a little locket sort of thing it was encased in plastic i think uh -huh. and the, the the thing she said was you know if you have faith you know, as in a mustard seed, you know, if your faith is, you know, which of course puts the emphasis on faith through trial and tribulation and you know, what I was growing up into and so forth. Yeah. But this, you've given that a great, this, this is so much better. And it, the passage doesn't say if you have faith as in a, a grain of mustard seed, it doesn't say that right. it's about the kingdom. So I appreciate your, yeah. I appreciate your, elaborating on this it makes yeah yeah greater sense to me yeah now this is uh you know this is uh this is this is mark uh this is mark's gospel so you know there are parallels in matthew and luke <clears throat> there are parallels in matthew and luke that do take this in they use the same image they use the same image of mustard seed but they do they do make a, a slightly different point with it um, but even there, you know, even there, the faith involved is not just generic, you know, it's not just generic faith with no object. It's or 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 with another object. It's not faith that um, you know, this is where the prosperity preachers go so wrong, is that <clears throat> they make faith itself like like the power of believing itself the force that's what and, this woman meant for me to take when she gave yeah, me the mustard yeah, seed. that yeah. was the that was the way and they, that's the way i've always thought of it you know not yeah. knowing how the other uh, gospel writers yeah. used it 
Yeah, yeah. They 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 make it about the power of believing itself. And so, you know, and so <clears throat> if you, you know, if you, you know, and this has this not only has, of course, you know, prosperity gospel applications, this also has, you know, certain uh new agey, new agey applications or expressions also. <clears throat> that if you will something hard enough, if you visualize your desired result and you do so enough and all that, that you'll get what you desire. You know, uh, prosperity preachers add a God element to it, make God the, in effect, the rewarder of your believing hard enough and long enough that you'll get what you'll get specifically what you pray for if you uh name it and claim it you know and, and that kind of business um that is wildly unbiblical i mean that, that's just wildly unbiblical because because even in those parables in those expressions in the other gospels that do talk about the faith faith as a seed it's not just it's not just directionless faith or or it's not just it's not just faith as such it's the faith of the kingdom it's the it's faith in what the kingdom power of god is about it's not about it's not faith so that you can get a new mercedes it's <laughs> it's faith that the kingdom that the kingdom will come uh that god's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven you know that that's what the the faith is about in the first place um uh, and so it's not just your private desires it's it's about the the spread of the kingdom um uh, and so you know it's there's just so much damage that can be done <clears throat> from scriptures that have been wrenched from their context and 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 made to sound like they they're saying something that in fact is the opposite of what they're saying uh so anyway that's a that's a rant i could go on any you know or give it i could give a ted talk on that anytime so i right. find that um almost every time this parable comes up and people start talking about the mustard seed there will be somebody in the group that will say Oh, but the mustard seed isn't really the smallest plant there ever was. I mean, there yeah. always has to be somebody who points this out. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. This is um, what probably is the case here is that <clears throat> the mustard seed had a kind of proverbial standing in the in the world of that day. It was almost proverbial that the mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds. Okay. Mm. And 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 that we and that the right way to understand that, if somebody raises that point, the the proper thing to say is, is that when Jesus says this, he's not making a scientific statement about which seed is the smallest. He's he's probably going along with a, a common Jewish kind of proverbial understand, a kind of a proverb that the mustard seeds are really really small seed. You know, I mean, for example, I could say, you know, just uh, let me just think of a couple of examples of this. You know, you might say, now uh, well, I'm, I'm just thinking of a couple. It's not this is not a perfect analogy, but you know, if I, you know, you speak of someone you love, you know, your your partner in life, your husband, your wife, you know, say, you know, that so and so is most 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 beautiful woman in the world or most, you know, wonderful man in the world. Now, 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 obviously, if Lisa says that to me, she's speaking literal truth, but, you know, <laughs> you know, no, <laughs> obviously not. Um, but when we speak that way, we're not speaking, we're not speaking literal truth. We're not trying to speak literal truth. We're not, we're not, we're not trying to make an objective evaluative statement you know it's like i have looked at every woman in the world and i have concluded on the basis of my widespread investigation that you in fact are the most beautiful woman in the world we That's call them hyperbole it's hyperbole right it's hyperbole you know it's obviously that's not what i'm saying what i am saying is that i think you are really really beautiful and i love you a whole lot 
you know, usually those two things kind of going together, you know, I, I think you're really beautiful. I am really turned on by you and I love you very, very much, you know, okay, right. That's what I'm actually saying when I say you're the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, uh, or alternately, if she's, you know, said that to me, you're the most wonderful man in the world, she would be saying, I'm that she really thinks I'm wonderful and she really loves me. Um, uh, and, or if I say that, or if I say that, you know, a play of a, a soccer player, you know, is the greatest, greatest player of all time. You know, what I'm saying is that I think that player is really, really good <laughs> and certainly is among one of the greatest players of all time. Am I making, am I truly making an evaluative statement that Lionel Messi is in fact a greater player than Pele, than Diego Maradona, or, you know, other people? No, not really. What I'm saying is that he's a really great player. Okay. Um, and so in the same way, there probably was some kind of, there probably was some kind of Jewish proverb that spoke of the mustard seed as, you know, the smallest of all seeds. It's the, you know, uh, and Jesus was probably, you know, kind of just, you know, falling back on that proverbial wisdom uh, such that people would would hear it and understand it and recognize what he was doing. Um, and so the idea here is that the message of the kingdom, acts that support the kingdom, that would that would usher in the kingdom, are acts and words, and deeds that are seemingly tiny, seemingly inconsequential, and yet have far-reaching effects beyond anything that we could imagine or predict. Um, so that's the uh, and so and that so that's a that you know that's a message of hope. You know, it's it's a statement about how the kingdom operates, but it's also a statement of hope. You know, to the extent that we are giving ourselves to this kingdom and to living for this kingdom, to the extent that we're doing that, sometimes doing that can be hard to maintain because it may look like, you know, that, uh, that, that what we're doing is in vain. You know, it may not look like we're, that we see the results, you know, in our own, in our own time or in, or, or even in our own lifetimes. You know, and so the uh, but the but the faith, the faith involved in this is that is that these tiny things, these things that look in, inconsequential have effects beyond what we can see. OK, that's going to be a really important message. I mean, that that is a very important message <laughs> for Mark, not just for Jesus, but in his own day, but for Mark to to relate to the community that is living and struggling in his own day because they're the ones who are kind of caught between a rock and a hard place they don't like the rome they don't like roman occupation any more than anybody else does um and yet they're not just getting opposition from the romans they're getting opposition from from uh from people who are you know, in a way, rightfully rebelling against Rome, but doing so in a way that is not the kingdom way. And so they're so these these Mark Christians are getting it from both sides. They're getting it from the Romans, but they're also getting it from Jews who don't think you're doing enough. And, and especially, I would add, Jewish Christians. That Jewish Christians are getting it from both sides because, because the Jews might look at these Jewish Christians and say, well, you know, you don't like Rome any more than you do, but you refuse to take up a sword. You know, you refuse to, to go to you go to war, go to go to battle. You know, what, what kind of what kind of Jew do you think you are? What kind of you know, what kind of uh, what kind of person are you? And, yeah, you can play, you know, they could have played the patriotic card. You know, the, the the Jews rising up in rebellion against Rome could have said, well, you know, don't you believe in the freedom of our people? 
you know, don't you believe that God wants to free us from the Roman yoke? And so it's a really difficult position. <laughs> it's a really difficult position to be in. And uh, and and so Mark is is supporting his community with this message of Jesus that you know that these that this the, the, this attitude about the kingdom as as the way that we bring about uh, that we eventually see the day of God's kingdom coming and bringing justice, bringing justice and peace to the world. Um, when you. I have a question. When you talk about Jewish Christians, Christian Jews, you're talking about the people in Mark's time, not Jesus's time, right? I mean, they were well, well, sort of. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about people who are ethnically Jewish, who are ethnically Jewish, who who at least have been have been raised on Jewish beliefs, customs, practices, and everything, who have embraced jesus as the as the messiah right but in jesus's own time i didn't think they were referred to as christians as jesus was living well, in they, well they weren't i mean I, I i to the extent that i would even use that phrase i would be i would use that phrase to talk about ethnic jews who were in process of following jesus you know, they, they were in, they were following Jesus around and listening to him and and trying to learn from him. Uh, but but yeah, it's only after it's only after, you know, Jesus's death and, and resurrection that we can really properly start speaking of, you know, Christians, you know, Jew, Jew, Jewish or otherwise Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians. Uh, you know, up until that, everybody, even the people following Jesus are still, you know, they're still in process. They're still kind of undecided. <laughs> and it's only with it's only with the death and resurrection that on the other side of that, <laughs> you know, that they start. They start making choices about, you know, about their allegiances and, and you know, who they're following and that kind of thing. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's read, uh, real quick, just read verses 33 and 34. And then I think in the interest of time, we'll leave uh, a lot that follows, uh, to, uh, two weeks from today. Um, but you'll see, you'll see that with verses 33 and 34, Jesus actually wraps up for now, wraps up his, uh, the teaching on parables and his use of parables. He says, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Okay. Now we've talked about, you know, this before, you know, about how uh, Jesus's parables uh, in in some ways, very intentionally, were meant to conceal as much as they were meant to reveal. <laughs> you know, they were meant to conceal. You know, the the people who aren't going to get it aren't going to get it through the parables. You know, if you're if you're already resisting the kingdom, you're not going to get it through the parables. It's it's only as you are open to it. Only as you have will more be given, but if you don't have it, even what you have will be taken away. It's this idea that the parables will only break through to people who already have something in them that can that can hear, can hear and appreciate. Uh, it's they who will hear the parables and see that there's something there that I want to know more of. And so the, and the disciples were in that boat, you know, at this point, the disciples were in the boat of people who weren't getting it, but they wanted to get it. And Jesus knew that they wanted to get it. And so he was, he was willing to take them aside and say, okay, I know, I know it's not, it's not quite breaking through, 
<laughs> let me explain it to you. And so, and and so he does that. He does that I, with those. I, I don't know if this is appropriate to say, but I've never thought about it like this before. But the parables were are kind of like uh, appetizers. They uh -huh. they uh -huh. get you ready for the for the entree. Yeah. And yeah. and the entree is coming, but I'm feeding you the appetizers right now. Yeah. Yeah. There. You know, an appetizer. I mean, what is a what is an appetizer? It's uh, an appetizer is meant to stir the appetite. You know, it's to it's to give you a foretaste of the glories that are are to follow. You know, and you go to a fine, especially you go to a fine restaurant. You know, with a with a renowned chef, and a chef's going to bring out a little appetizer. Usually, they're very little too. It's only when you go to these you know these chain American. Uh, you know, bogus restaurants where you get, you know, huge plates of potato skins and, you know, and onion rings. And those are your appetite. Those aren't appetizers, friends. <laughs> to any, to any, to any reasonable person, that's the main event, you know? Uh, <laughs> but when you go to a, to a proper restaurant, you go to a proper restaurant, an appetizer is usually a very small plate. It's a very small plate. And it is literally meant to, excite the appetite you eat it you go oh my god oh my god that is so good i cannot wait cannot wait for the for the main dish for my entree to arrive you know and uh and yeah <clears throat> these app these these appetizers these parable appetizers are meant for people who are able able to receive them they are enough to make you want more, to make you ask, to, you know, some people aren't going to get it. Sometimes you offer appetizers to people and it's, you know, you go to a, a fine dining restaurant or whatever. And, you know, some people just, you know, some, just the way some people don't appreciate, uh, you know, certain works of art. You know, go to an art museum and you just look at art and you go, <laughs> you know, you're like, huh? You know, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not judging if, you know, if that's you, you know, or, or you and some, I'm not, that's not judgment. That's because I'm like that too. Sometimes I, I just look at, I look at st some things in art museums and I just, <laughs> you know, I just have no idea what, what, what it's about, you know, and, and that's okay, you know. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes you go to a fine dining restaurant and you, they put something in front of you and you just go. And when that you have that effect, that is <laughs> just as the appetizers bouncing off you, it's unlikely the main course is going to have a great effect on you either, you know, but in the same way, if you get that appetizer and you're like, oh. Gosh, that's so good, you know. And you can't wait. You can't wait for what follows. It makes you want to know. It makes makes Lisa want to ask the chef. Now, now, uh, Chef Atchison, what did you do? You know, what did you put into so and so? And she actually has these conversations. The last time we went to five and ten, the last two times we've been to five and ten, <laughs> she gets Hugh Atchison over to the table. You know, he's a he's a celebrity chef. He's a big deal. He's a big deal. He's on the cooking channel, the Food Network, and all that. Um, and he's home. You know, he lives right over right over near the UGA. You know, and uh, and and Lisa will get him over. He's very nice. He's very nice. He's very approachable. And uh, and Lisa will ask him questions about well, what did you use in so and so. Uh, but but that's what a good appetizer to a receptive soul to a receptive palate is meant to do it's meant to ask have you asking questions and and desiring to go further you yeah. know uh, that's a great analogy but i think where it falls down is that sometimes the parables are so strange that <laughs> they may not want them as an appetizer <laughs> you know say, what am i eating here right <laughs> Right. But I was on I was on a Greek cruise years ago, and you know sometimes the things they would offer us as appetizers and luxury cruise were just so I'm I'm feeling a little bit about some of the later parables that yeah. way. Yeah. They're 
they're mysterious and they stay in my head, but I don't quite know whether I want to eat them or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now I remember uh, we went to, uh, some of y'all may be familiar with uh, the chef, uh, Kevin Gillespie. Uh, he has, he's, he's an Atlanta chef and he's, uh, he, he was like, he was like a finalist in one of the seasons of Top Chef. Uh, but he's a he's a kind of a Atlanta, lo, you know, locally and regionally renowned chef. He has a restaurant in Decatur, I believe, and and so forth. And uh, we went to his restaurant when he had his restaurant on Cheshire Bridge Road in in Atlanta. Uh, we went and we got up. It was one of those things where you they bring out appetizers you didn't order. Okay. And, you know, they, it's like a tasting menu and they want you to taste, you know, this. And one of the appetizers they brought out were these little oysters, these little oysters that were, um, it wasn't so much in the cooking of them. It was in the, uh, it was in everything that was surrounded the oyster that was supposed to be, you know, really exciting. Now, of course, neither Lisa nor I are terribly excited about, about raw oysters. Now, Joel Buchanan Sr., that's another story. You know, he loves, he loves his raw. Yeah, it's there. You know, uh, I'm not a big fan. Lisa's not a big fan. That was not necessarily the best first thing to bring out. Uh, fortunately, it got better because then they brought out Brussels sprouts, which some people think, oh, gosh, Brussels sprouts, gross, you know, whatever. Oh, my God. And I, that's what I would have thought. That's what I would have thought. But. You know, Kevin Gillespie thinks they're good. Maybe I should think they're good too. So I tried them. It was one of the, one of the most wonderful things I've ever put in my mouth. It was absolutely fantastic, uh, and it was and the pre and the preparation was actually deceptively simple, uh, but what they did was just amazing. And and Chef Gillespie came out, and of course Lisa. <laughs> Lisa had questions and everything. And he, and he, like you, Atchison here in Athens, you know, very willing, very willing to talk about, you know, what they did and, and all that kind of thing. And, uh, but those Brussels sprouts worked, you know, they had the desired effect that made us ask questions, made us want more. And, uh, and that's what, and that's what ideally what the parables of Jesus are supposed to do. But it also goes to, why it's important that as we study them, that we do, especially with some of the parables, which do come off, especially, you know, to 21st century American people, uh, may come off as rather obscure, which means that we've, you know, maybe, and maybe we have to get behind them in ways that a first century Jewish audience wouldn't necessarily need to do that extra work simply because, there's some things that they would understand that we wouldn't necessarily understand on the surface, uh, just re just reading in English translation. So, uh, so, anyway. so that's why we have Bible study. That's a, that's <laughs> so we can kind of unpack unpack some things that that uh, may not may not make complete sense just just on a on a surface reading of them. All right. So we're going to wrap up for today. So we see that uh, in chapter four, you know, heavy, heavy emphasis on parables, but also on the, uh, but parable, parables as a vehicle for relating um, the the kingdom message of Jesus and the reception of it and what you do with it. Next week, we are going to start at verse 35 here in chapter four, and we're going to see- Oh, two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Two weeks from today. We're going to look at a series <clears throat> in uh, verse 35 of chapter four. We're going to we're going to look at four. Oh, shoot. Siri did it again. I didn't get that. Oh. Could you try again? Siri, I'm not interested in talking to you. OK. <clears throat> a series of <laughs> a series of. Um, mighty works stories. For the next little while, there are going to be four such stories in a row. And the first is starting in verse 35, and it's Jesus stilling a storm. 
It's going to be followed in chapter five by Jesus healing the garrison demoniac. Okay. And then there's, of course, uh, two more, two more such mighty works stories to follow. Um, those are those are going to be really good. And I, I think espe you're especially going to appreciate the garrison demoniac. Uh, and because there's there there are hidden layers to that story, some wonderful hidden layers to that story. All right. But that's two weeks. That's two weeks from today. All right, y'all. Well, we are uh, we are five days away from uh, from Christmas, four days away from Christmas Eve and uh, <clears throat> Look very much looking forward to uh, to the, to uh, that service here in uh, friendship that night. Uh, I know that I know that St. Gregory's. I'm sure will have a have a, a beautiful service probably later. I guess your St. Gregory's service would be Episcopalians tend to favor later <laughs> later services. Yeah, uh, Nine thirty with like passes, you know, and stuff and. Yeah, yeah, eight o'clock, eight o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ten. I mean, I think I think the music starts at nine thirty, and then at ten o'clock they start the service. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Here at uh, you know, here at friendship, at friendship, there's there is not the cultural expectation of that, and so, uh, so when I came along and said I really want to do it at five o'clock, uh. I'm going to do it at five o'clock while it's, you know, it's still light out at the beginning. It's getting a little dark at the end. Uh, so we'll have the luminaries, the candle luminaries outside um, lighting up the driveway at the, at the church. It'll be nice. Uh, but then we'll give, we'll give Lisa, give uh, Lisa and me enough opportunity to, to, to drive down to Auburn and spend, uh, spend the night and, and enjoy Christmas morning in Auburn. So, all right. Well, let's uh, let's close with prayer, and then we'll be on our way. All right, let's pray. God, we give you thanks for this day, for this opportunity to gather as we do every week. We uh, we thank you for this season, for this season in which we are confronted with uh, the the mess, the Advent message of waiting, of hope, and the uh, this message uh, that we're confronted with even in the gospel of mark today this message of the kingdom and how it comes in seemingly small and inconsequential ways but but that we are invited into this work of the kingdom and invited to trust <clears throat> and to acts of faith and love uh, lord lead us ever deeper into that mystery and may we be faithful Lord, we pray for the many needs of the world and especially for those uh, for those people who have asked for our prayers. Uh, we do remember uh, Carol and Sandy and for uh, uh, for and for uh, for Sharon Hernberg and for for anyone who is uh, anyone who is uh, struggling with any kind of, of health issue or or difficulty. Uh, Lord, we pray for all those people for whom this season is a difficult season, despite all the, you know, the messages of, of joy and cheer and merrymaking, that this season is difficult for, for many people too. And we pray for your comfort and for your peace and for your hope. Uh, Lord, we pray all these things now in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for a great study today.